Okay, let's pick up where we left off. Y'all turn to Luke 24. And we're talking about quenching the Spirit. And again, we're talking about the wiles of the devil and how we've got to stand. Well, one of the ways we're going to have to stand against the wiles of the devil is we're going to have to understand what it means to quench the Spirit or to put out the fire is the idea. And we've been looking at how the Holy Spirit is compared to fire and His activity. And to quench the Spirit has more to do with to, to hinder His promptings and His urgings. And we're going to look at this really because this is important. To grieve the Spirit has more to do with through our behavior and our activity to, to hurt Him, to, you know, that kind of thing. But to quench Him, this is the, to me the main way Satan uh, works today in hindering us. Now, the Holy Spirit shows up as fire compared to fire in the Scripture. We've considered how fire gives light and how you and I turn from the light and we, we cut off the light on our own and therefore we hinder Him. But we're looking now at how the Holy Spirit through the fire gives this warmth, through love, through joy. This, this, this warmth is, is, you know, again as we see. But I thought I would read y'all an old hymn somebody wrote because I just really like the way he puts this. This is called, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth, through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. Here he's praying for God to move in him and work in him, to move him to love him. Teach me to know that thou art always nigh. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear. To check the rising doubt. And we all know about that. And, uh, and rebel sigh. Teach me the patience of an unanswered prayer. Hast thou not bid me love thee, God and King? All, all thine own soul, heart, and strength and mind. I see thy cross, there teach my heart to cling. Oh, let me seek thee, oh, let me find. In other words, how do we access these things? We always get our mind started at the cross, don't we? I mean, what would make me think that God would give me of His Spirit like I see in here? Well, look at that cross. God gave His Son to die for me. There's the place to start. Now, the last verse says, Teach me to love thee as thine angels love, one holy passion filling all my frame, the kindling of the heavens descending dove, my heart and altar, thy love the flame. In other words, he's talking about getting this burning love for God. And this is, again, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Now I want to just show you a couple examples of this. In Luke 24, 13, we just mentioned this, but let's go look. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. They walked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now I want you all to remember, the night before he died, Jesus told him that he would send them another comforter, didn't he? Yeah. Then who had been acting as comforter up until then? Jesus with Jesus the Spirit. Himself. He said, the Spirit has been with you, he shall be in you later on, right? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus departs, what does that leave these disciples? With no, without the leadership of the Spirit. And you see it in them. But now here comes Jesus. He, he's walking beside me. He asks him, what, what's this you're talking about? Verse 18. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? I want you all to consider this just practically. In their estimation, had the world just come to an end. I mean, they looked around them and they thought, that's it. It can't be helped now. This, this, I mean, this is it. It can't, nothing can happen. This is, we've hit an all-time low. This is it. And what was right around the corner? The greatest revival in history. Wasn't it? The greatest working of the Spirit. See, they didn't know. We look around today. Don't that, you look at the world today at this, all this liberal junk. Ain't that kind of how you think? There ain't no help for We don't know. Don't think like that. Now it says, he said unto them, what things? They said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. You see, they've relegated Jesus to just another prophet, haven't they? How the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Do y'all see any faith in these men? Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. 
Look, don't ever let someone tell you that God saved you because of your faith. God saved you by faith. It's the means that He saves us by. If it was your faith, these men wouldn't be downtrodden. They would be just as steady right here as they were before. But they're not. They're without the Spirit. They have nothing. Now, y'all know Jesus goes on and starts telling them, uh, uh, you know, what's going to happen. Verse 25, He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Now here were these men who had been destitute of the Spirit. Now all of a sudden Christ is with them, right? And everything starts to change. Now it says, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Now what did He just say? What things? how he ought to suffer and die. You know all Christ did here? The same thing he sent the disciples to go out and do. Preach, preach the gospel God. from the Old Testament. Yeah. Now it says, they drew nigh unto the village whether they went, he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Can they tell that there's some power here? Mm -hmm. Hey, haven't we all known what it means to get around someone that understands things about the Word of God in a way which we don't? And it, it, it's captivating, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You want to be with them more. You want to spend time with them. You want to talk with them. You want to pick their brain. They realize this man knows something, don't they? So he said, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. He went into tarry with them. Now I want you all again, the, the imagery is all here. If we'll just stop and think about it. It's toward evening. In other words, darkness is coming, isn't it? When does light always come? Darkness. You look down through the times. When do the greatest revivals and work of the Spirit come? When it's the darkest. In October 30th, 1517, did it look like Rome had just wiped out belief? The Word of God was gone. It looked like nothing could happen. And on the 31st, God raised up Martin Luther, didn't He? Well, this is the same kind of thing. And now here comes Christ. And verse 30, It came to pass as He sat meat with them, He took bread and blessed it, break it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they knew Him, and He vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn with us while He talked with us by the way, and while He opened to us the Scriptures? You see that burning heart? Well, what's that from? It's from the Spirit of God. And let's go look at one more example just to, to, to use them. Go to John 21. If we pay attention in Scripture, this is always there. Folks, it's the presence of God and being aware of the presence of God that, that emboldens us. Now, does that mean that Christ's Spirit is not present with us? No, it means you and I deny it through unbelief, through turning from it. He never is going to take the Spirit from us, but you and I deny it and we quench Him and cut Him off. And then what happens? We've got to be made to face Him again and be filled, don't we? So watch what Peter does here. Again, this is the same Peter that jumped up and was going to cut off the man's ear, right? Cut off his head, I'm sure, was his original intention. But now Jesus is gone. Verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. Folks, Peter's ready to go back to the world, isn't he? It says, They said unto him, We also go with thee. All of them. They went forth, entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Don't you love that that's in there? Mm -hmm. Did they have any success without the Lord? They caught nothing, right? But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Of course it's morning. Christ is there. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then said Jesus unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. He said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. They catch 153 fish. Now do you all see the picture? Without Christ, nothing. With the presence of Christ, they're successful. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked and cast himself into the sea. Look at the turnaround. Folks, one second, Peter is downtrodden. He's going to go back to fishing. Maybe I can get my business going again. Maybe, you know, 
turns back to the world for his supply and his sustenance, and there's nothing there. He's unsuccessful. The second his eyes are focused on the Lord, he forgets everything and dives in to go for him, doesn't he? You see how that works? Can y'all see Martin Luther walking into that? I hate to keep using this as an example. Again, people say, are you a Lutheran? No, I'm just showing you what God does. Martin Luther went into that town to preach. He went to that meeting knowing that they were going to wanted to kill him, didn't he? But he went in there hoping that somebody would be reformed by the Word of God. And they did everything possible to shut him up. And again, in that meeting, he said, I can do no other. Here I stand on the Word of God. I can do no other. He couldn't. It was impossible. Could he? What would his conscience have done if he would try to gone again? Oh, he, oh, he would have vomited on the spot. Yeah. Folks, he couldn't have it, right? Now that's the idea. Okay, so then Peter, he just dives right in. Now this was all due to the Lord's presence being understood. I want you all to notice. Was the Lord there? Yes. But when did they become emboldened? When they understood that He was there. Is the Lord with us? When are you and I going to become emboldened? When we understand how He's there and what He can do. Alright, so... Uh, when you and I don't enjoy His presence, when we don't spend time in prayer and in the Word, you and I quench the Spirit, don't we? Now, the most effective tool of the devil in quenching the Spirit in this present world to me seems to be this present world. Okay? This world literally is the strongest tool in getting us to quench the Spirit. When Jesus departed, what was Peter's first thought? The world. How about the two on the road to Emmaus? When Jesus was gone, what did they say? We'll go back home. Isn't that their attitude? Go back to uh, Romans 12. I know we just covered this the other night, but go look at Romans 12 real quick. <clears throat> yeah, I do think about all the, the old, what we call old time preachers like John Edwards. Like you said, he didn't, he didn't do it jumping around. He didn't do it any. He just spoke it. Yep. It's the word of God. Yeah. Yep. It is. He, you know that Lonnie makes a great point. Hey, there are people, you know, wrote about when Jonathan Edwards preached "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." Famous sermon. If you never read it, you ought to. Mm -hmm. We I, we probably don't preach. I know we don't preach enough of that type of thing. But in a monotone voice, he delivered that thing. Read it, and do you know it was so powerful, and the Spirit of God convicted them people so much. You know what grown men were doing? They were lifting up their feet subconsciously because they were scared of the fire of hell. That's a strong sermon, isn't it? He, 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 that's the way he preached. He didn't like his sermon. No, no, he didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. I believe he married Whitfield's daughter, didn't he? Uh, he married, uh, well, I don't think it wasn't Whitfield. It was somebody famous as daughter, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some famous preacher's daughter. He sure did. Okay, now in uh, Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, remember this is the great turning point in the book of Romans, from a doctrine to application. And the first thing Paul tells us with everything we've learned about justification by faith, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, based on the mercy of God you have seen, isn't it only logical that He owned you? That's what he's saying. After all this doctrine I've laid out, doesn't it all but make sense that now you owe yourself to the Lord? So present yourself to Him. But notice he says we must present ourselves holy, acceptable unto God. What would render a sacrifice unacceptable? Spotted and blemished. Now how do me and you get ourselves spotted and blemished? with the world. That's why we the, the priest was washed and then had to keep washing. Jesus told them, y'all are clean, now let's keep cleaning. You and I are saved, we're being saved. The washing of water of the Word. So watch the very first thing He announces after saying that we are to present ourselves, dedicate ourselves a living sacrifice. It says, be not conformed to this world. Then what do y'all think is the major obstacle to serving God? This world. Y'all know we know about this, don't we? Mm -hmm. What is the thing that's always drawing your attention away from the things of God? It's this world. More so than anything. Why do I say today more so? I say it in, in a very uh, dogmatic way too. I come back here and I draw the timeline across. Based on the evidence of Scripture. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
Can Satan just retain what he wants to retain any longer? He can. Jesus has taken that power. What was the only way Satan could get Adam back here out of the will of God? Could he kill Adam? What did he have to do? He had to get Adam to turn. He had to get Adam to take his eyes off the will of God and, and focus on self, didn't he? Well, here we are over here because of the work of the second Adam on our behalf. We're saved. We who have believed. Can he get you out of that position? Can he, folks, he can't do anything to you directly as far as forcing you out of the will of God. But what does he do? Look at this fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we call this? the most advanced form of his system? According to the book of Revelation, it's on this side of the cross, and it's called Babylon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And again, what is Babylon? It's this world. Mm -hmm. Boy, look at it today. Is it at your fingertips? Mm -hmm. Y'all think about the, the, the disadvantages we have with this world. Well, we better have the Spirit of God. What in the world would ever cause one of us to turn from all the luxuries of this world? Only the Spirit of God. But you know, it's only because we think they're luxuries, don't we? You know what you find out later? Yeah. Folks, I, look, I think air condition is a luxury. And it is. I thank the Lord I have air condition. But on the second of every month, it don't look like a luxury. Yeah. When the power bill comes, they say, well, there's a, some, I, I suffer some loss, right? Yeah. Well, is there anything in this world that's going to make it through the fire? then what will you have to hold or to show for on the other side? Mm -hmm. Then all the time we spent focusing on this world, chasing after this world, you know what it really is doing? It's costing us eternally, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's the main thing that causes you and I to look away from the Lord. We look away from the light to look at the things of the world. You and I lose the warmth of God because we're focused on the coldness of the world. And this is our, it's, again, it's always the way. Let me show you another example of it. Go to 1 John 2. These things always seem to be laid side by side together in Scripture. Yeah, and, you know, I keep saying this, and I hope it, it's... They say repetition is, a, is, a, is good. I, I hope so. It is good. But I, I really do hope that if nothing else, I could prompt someone to read the Scriptures more. You know, we all get in and we study, and study is a good thing, but folks, we need to read the Scriptures too. Read them like a book because what happens in studying is we get tunnel vision on a subject and we miss things. I'm not telling you not to study. I'm telling you read. Read the Scriptures and you'll see how these things always lay together. and You'll see in the whole context. And instead of comparing a verse with a verse, you know, and that, that's okay. You can do that. What you'll wind up doing is you'll wind up comparing a context with a context and then you'll be on the right page. And now watch what he says here about this. In 1 John 2, 8, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true? And he just said, I don't write unto you a new commandment. Then he says, a new commandment I write. Well, which is it? What he means is, what I'm telling you is new in as much as the way I'm going to phrase it, but all it is is what the law said. What did Jesus Christ sum up the whole law into? Yeah, love God with all your heart and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, didn't he? So verse 8, he says, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Now this is the reason we can do this, because the darkness is past. And in other words, because the light's available, this can be done. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He, now that doesn't mean that a person, uh, he's not saying a man, is saved one minute and lost the next. He's also not saying if you have cases where you don't love your brother, you're lost. He's saying to love your brother is to walk in the light. Now, can a saved person walk in darkness? We do it all the time, right. don't we? He says, verse 10, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Y'all see the difference? He ain't talking about losing your salvation or being lost. I'm not stumbling. So then to abide in the light. Jesus said, abide in me, I'm the vine. If you abide in me, you'll bring forth fruit. He said, verse 11, He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that the darkness has blinded his eyes. 
Now, he goes on talking about these things, okay? But he says uh, uh, to who he's writing to and all, but come to verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, in, in opposition to love your brother as yourself, walk in the light, avoid the darkness, don't stumble, what did he put on the other side? The world. You see how that's always what we've got to... I mean, this is the thing you and I face. When I turn from the light, I face the darkness, the darkness of this world. Who orchestrates this world's doctrine? Satan. Satan. So if I don't follow God's teaching, I'm going to be walking according to the devil without knowing it. How about the warmth? What's the opposite of the warmth of the joy of the Holy Spirit? Coldness and it's the coldness of this world, folks. Coldness and indifference, isn't it? Have y'all ever seen a time when people were more indifferent and cold than they are right now? No. I mean, look, it's, it's technology, in my opinion, is really what's driving this. Have y'all tried to talk to a... I know Lonnie has, but you tried to talk to the average teenager lately? They can't even carry on a conversation. You know why not? Technology. Folks, you, you, I'm serious. They can't even carry on a conversation. Why would anybody want to limit conversation? The gospel spread by conversation. How about, how about communicating, loving? He, me and Lexi were eating one day and I said, watch this. We watched the whole family eat a meal and they never said a word. Right. The whole family was like this uh -huh. the whole time. And, and Look, I'm not saying you can't have a cell phone. Don't, I'm not talking any of this. What I'm saying is that the world cares about the world and its own. That's all they look out for number one, right? There's another example. Go back watch the Lord say. Go to John, regular John 15. John 15, 17, the Lord tells them, These things I command you, that you love one another. Now watch him bring in the other side immediately. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And he goes on again describing more of these things. But what he's basically saying is, there's the warmth of Christ and there's the world. And you can't have both at one time, can you? All right. So then, what's the result of this quenching the the warmth of the spirit? Well, the world looks and they see no joy and no love in the church. Would you agree with that? Right. Look, the world looks at the church today and they see indifference, coldness, lifeless, joylessness, formalism, and legalism. The other half they look at, they see emotional foolishness. Uh, stealing money, pilfering, robbing, begging. They look at that. Why would you want to be part of that? I wouldn't. He, look, one half is like the man I said, I'm here to preach the gospel. And an old man reached and got his wallet, his hand on his wallet, and he told me, now I'm ready. See, that's, he's seen what all that foolishness happening. The other bunch looks and they're convicted of their sin, but they look at the church and they think, man, that's the most lifeless, cold. Don't we all know something about Boy, I was raised in the world's most cold, formal religion. There ain't no joy there. I mean, it's Lonnie knows what I mean. It is just, it's, it's harsh, you know, and there's no joy at all. I couldn't stand going. I hated going there. It was just miserable. Well, then I got out of that, got in a church that was even colder, if you can believe it or not. It had people in there that hated each other's guts. One man in there hated that preacher so bad, he come to my house one weekend and told me he wanted me to get, get in the truck, he was going to go over there and do something about it. About the preacher. And folks, the preacher was the most sincere man there. It's just, you see, it's a lifeless, joyless, just, and when you get around somebody that's got a little life or joy, and there were a few, I met Wayne there, and it, when you get around somebody that has life and joy, what you find out is those others want to stamp it out quick as they can. If somebody wants to uh, study and, and grow, it, no, they got to put that out, and they do. They quench it immediately. Well, God knows what He's doing. You, you, you have somebody reach over and uh, you, you run out of material to burn in this area. 
Folks, God only lit one fire. Remember back there in the Old Testament, He lit that altar and that fire kept it, they had to keep it going, didn't they? But if you start a fire here and you burn this area completely out. Yeah, I was with a friend of mine one time that owned a business doing uh, like bulldozing and track hoeing and all that. And he was up in Citronelli also did a lot of burning for people, you know, uh, controlled burning. And I would watch how he would do it, and it was fascinating to me how he would do it. He knew how to use the wind, and he would he, he just he could control the burn. But he would burn it till it all burnt. When it got burnt, he would get find a lighter knot laying around, you know, a piece of a pine, and he would just get that lighter lit, and he would take that, and he'd walk over with that stick of lighter knot, and he would start a new area. He didn't spray more fuel. He didn't, you know what I mean? He never did that. He, he got the original fire going and all he did was moved it around where it, it could burn. Well, that's exactly what God's done. Look at the way the Spirit of God come into an area. They said Paul had turned Asia upside down, didn't they? And then what happened? Paul wrote later, all Asia's turned away from him. The fire came in and burnt through, didn't it? And then it goes on. And, and it comes back sometimes. And this is how the Spirit works. So this. The, the world then looks at this coldness and they want nothing to do with it. <clears throat> Alright? Let's see. We did that. Let's move to the next one. How about fire is power, isn't it? I mean, y'all think about the... Uh, okay, up there where... Uh, <clears throat> up there where your daughter works. Alright? We get our power from there, don't we? Literally, where's that power coming from? It's coming oh, generate by yeah. what? That's fire, folks. Yeah. It is. It's fire. Oh, yeah. It's either coal or natural gas, or it could even be nuclear. That one's not, but it's fire. And fire generates power. You know, it's amazing. Fire generates its own wind. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. I know. Y'all ever watch the fire and watch a tornado in a fire? I love watching that. I burn trash in the back and watch a fire will generate its own wind in that fire and get going. Yeah. Yeah. Fire does that. Okay? Well, the Spirit does such a thing. He generates power. Now, we already read the verse that says uh, that there's a power that worketh in us, right? Remember we read that? Paul said, the power that worketh in you. Go over back to, uh, while we're here, go to Acts chapter 1. In Acts 1.8, he tells them, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now watch what this power causes them to do. And you shall hoop and holler and jump pews. And... No. It says, You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now I want you all to please consider this if we just think logically. All right? There are those that say, yes, they got that power on the day of Pentecost. They were baptized with the Spirit, but that was just for them. Well, what about this part that says the uttermost parts of the earth? Did these men go to the uttermost parts of the earth? These men went to in their area, didn't they? Where's the uttermost parts of the earth? Folks, it's still going to the uttermost parts of the earth. Gentile. It's the Gentiles, but it's every part of the earth. Yeah. Uttermost right. is the furthest place, right? That's right. Well, if anything's going to be done and anybody's going to be saved, what's going to have to be active? The power. <laughs> the power's got to be there. Okay, another example would be go to chapter 2. In chapter 2, when, the, when Peter's preaching, and he's preaching unto them, you know, remission of sins and telling them they're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Watch what he says in chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise, the promise of the Holy Ghost. Under the new covenant, wasn't one of the promises, I'll pour out my spirit. Now he says, for the promise is unto you, those men that day, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, has God quit calling today? No. Then has the power stopped? No. Folks, the only way the power stops is when you and I stop it. We turn from We quench the power of God first and foremost by unbelief. We don't believe that any of these things are possible. <clears throat> Alright, go look over at... Uh, 
Well, I've already quoted the verse where he told Timothy that we, God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, right? right? We've got the spirit of power. Go over to Colossians 1. In Colossians 1.27... Paul says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you now, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor in Christ, Paul's doing this, striving according to my incredible intelligence, and he doesn't say any of that, does he? How is he striving? According to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Was there a power working in Paul? Was that power there the day before the road to Damascus? It wasn't even there the day at Damascus. In Paul, was it? But did it come on him three days later? Now look, there's a difference between salvation, regeneration, and the pouring out of the Spirit. Sometimes they're linked, it's almost together. In Paul's case, there was three days difference, wasn't there? In the case of the apostle, many days. In other cases, it was longer. Sometimes there's years. You read about some of these men that go years without having any of this, and then all of a sudden. But don't make the two the same. They're not the same. So then what's the thing you and I need to be praying to God for? Fill us with your Spirit, Lord. If He doesn't go to work, if He don't fan the flame, nothing's going to happen. Now go over to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Now are these passages, the one we just read, is that still written to us today? Mm -hmm. Still applicable? Do we have anything that says, no, that's just for the first century? Mm -hmm. No, nothing. Alright? Philippians 2 verse 12. <laughs> Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For or because. Why do we have to be obedient and, and let this thing work out of us? Because it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So if it's God working in us, by what person of the Godhead? The Spirit. What about that part that says to will? If it's God that's working to will in us, what gave Martin Luther the desire to go to Rome? Oh, the Spirit of God. Yeah. Folks, Martin Luther wouldn't have gone there of his own accord. Come on, use common sense. That's the last place he would have went. Remember when Jesus Christ set his face to go to Jerusalem? And they told him, Lord, last time you went there, they wanted to kill you. But where was the Spirit of God leading him? Your folks, this was the Son of God here to do God's will. If you and I are going to do things that are in the will of God, we've got to be obedient to the promptings of the Spirit, don't we? Mm -hmm. Look, don't you all know what it is when the Spirit prompts you to pray? We all know. We, we know that feeling, don't we? It just you're being prompted to pray. And what's the first obstacle you and I got to overcome? Sam. This world. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm, I'm busy doing this. I'll get around to that later. Will it come later? Mm -hmm. No. Remember Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock? He, there's a great example of how you and I quench the Spirit. It, uh, if y'all would turn over there real quick, we'll just look at it. Go all the way back to Song of Solomon. Psalm 5. Right after Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Chapter 5, Song of Solomon. You know, another example of how this was, do you remember what Paul said was causing him to do his work as an ambassador? He said, the love of Christ constraineth us. Constrain doesn't mean hold back. It means that's, that's the thing keeping it all together, keeping it going. Then what was causing Paul to continue on? Spirit. The Spirit of God. Do you think Paul, of his own accord, got stoned, got up, and cared enough about them people to go in there and preach to them again? No. No, folks, that ain't normal. That's not normal. And somebody again would say, yeah, but that was just for the first century. Do you think it was normal 
for Hudson. Y'all familiar with Hudson Taylor? Or do you think that was normal? I'm saying that ain't normal human activity to move to China and to get in China where it's comfortable and say, no, they done heard this, I need to go further in. To look, could get far into China as he could go and then to look around at the people and say, you know what, I'm not going to have any, uh, any success at all trying to preach to these people as long as I don't appear to be like these people. If I'm going to be what to these people what I need to be to preach the gospel, I'm going to need to be all things to all people. Paul, towards the Jews, became a Jew. When with the Gentiles, Paul became a Gentile. I promise y'all, I bet Paul did not want to eat pork. Not after all his life. So what did Hudson Taylor do? He grew him some pigtails and started wearing a skirt and eating rice with sticks and he lived right there among them, didn't he? That ain't normal, folks. It ain't normal at all. Well, what was happening? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God causes these things. Watch Song of Solomon here. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Now remember, this whole book is a discussion between the bride and his bridegroom. And we know what this is. Christ and His church. Verse 2. I sleep. This is the, the, the bride, the woman. I sleep, but my heart waketh. Notice your heart waketh. Chapter 5, verse 2. Yep. Yeah. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. In other words, I've been on the outside looking in, and now here you are all clean, and I'm ready to come in. Notice she says, my undefiled. Now, if she had been defiled, could he come in? No. Do you and I ever shut him out by our defilement? Sure we do. So he says, verse 3, she says, I've put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? In other words, she's laying in bed and it's late. She's clean. She's washed. She's ready for bed. She's comfortable. And he knocks at the door. Now, what's her first uh, instinct? to make excuses why not to go. Don't we know about this when the Spirit prompts us? You'd be prompted to pray or prompted to study. Aren't there a million things that you'd rather do before? You get the prompt to, to turn. Some Scripture comes on your heart for a minute. You think, I wonder, you know, I wonder what if He could have meant what's the thing to do. Go get it out and start fooling. Right. Go dig at it. Go read. Go look. Go see what others have said. Go spend time with it. But what do we say? Well, you know, I better cut the grass first. I better wash the dishes first. I better... Now, all those are things we have to do, aren't they? But what should this woman have done when her beloved, who has been on the outside, came knocking? Open the door with the police. She should have jumped up and ran, not worried about getting her feet dirty, right? Right. Verse 4. My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. In other words, she lay there not doing it. And the beloved sent in a stronger urge, didn't he? Now, we all know about this. Hey, you get the urge, and then the urge comes stronger. And we lay around a minute thinking about it. She said, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of love. In other words, when it suited her, was she all sincere and ready? Yeah. Ain't that how me and you act many times? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Lord, now I'm ready to pray. And we're all ready to do it. And you get on your knees and it's like the prayer just won't come. Haven't we all experienced this? Yeah. You were being prompted and what do we do? No we deny it. We quench the Spirit. Watch what He says. Six, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when He spake. I sought Him, but I could not find Him. I called Him, but He gave me no answer. Now there's a wonderful picture of quenching the Spirit right there, isn't it? And yet we all do it. Who's behind it? Satan. How does Satan get us like the carrot in front of the, on the little rascals? That donkey would chase that carrot all day, wouldn't it? What did you and I have dangling right there all the time? This world, folks. This world's there all the time. Alright, let's go look at an example real quick of just how they preached. In the book of Acts, y'all go to Acts 4. Were Peter and them learned men? No, they were unlearned. Did the Holy Spirit give them the wisdom they needed? Were Peter and them mighty, brave, strong soldiers? Did the Spirit give them what they needed? You know, you think on those things. Who's got to supply the soldier? 
So we weren't sending them into battle. The Spirit will supply us. Folks, God promised He would. But what do me and you do? We don't believe it. We don't. He, you know, and I, I hate to reference Band of Brothers all the time, but there's a great scene in there where there's one of those guys that's so terrified and so scared that they're coming at him and they're all fighting, but one guy's laid down in the foxhole, just can't do anything. Terrified. And the leader's hollering at him, get up. He just can't do anything. He's got a gun, he's got all the training. He's got ammunition. He's got everything he needs but fear stopping him, right? Mm -hmm. You know what finally happens to him? He goes blind from his fear. It's true now. He went what they call it a hysterical blindness, they call it. It came back, but he went blind from his fear. He was so scared he went blind. Boy, isn't that a perfect picture of me and you? We get supplied with everything we need and we're so terrified by fear that we blind ourselves to what God's really willing to do. Sure, and we do it to ourselves. In Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Can you tell when somebody... Uh, you, somebody stands up to preach or to teach or to speak or to spread the gospel and when they start talking you'll know right away whether they've been with Jesus yeah, or not, absolutely. won't you? You listen to someone and you think that person has never... He, I once heard a great story as an example of this. A man went to a conference. It was an a old Presbyterian preacher named Barnhouse. Barnhouse went to a conference one time they were having and said they, they asked some people to pray and said a man got up, some preacher got up and started praying, and he said, oh, uh, oh God of wrath and fire and vengeance, and thou art so far from us. And he used all these wonderful, beautiful words, you know, thou and thee, and uh, we canst approach unto thee, we this and all with your mighty. And he just went on and on about this. And Barnhouse said the man next to him leaned over and said, somebody get that guy a New Testament. <laughs> Isn't that the way to say it? In other words, that man didn't know Christ. He was talking a bunch of fancy things, but he didn't know Christ. He wouldn't have been speaking like that, would he? Okay, so then when Peter and them stood up to speak, did they do it with boldness? Well, what would you call boldness? Folks, that's power. I mean, imagine these stupid, uneducated fishermen walking into lawyers and baffling them with their knowledge of the Scripture. You know, I mean, you, I mean that's really what it boils down to. That's what they did. And they did it over and over. At the same time, I'm just going to read y'all something. I tell you, just look at verse 31 since we're here. It says, When they had prayed, now this is the whole group, there's 5,000. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. Does it say the twelve were filled and the others listened? No. They were all filled. Does it say they were all filled except those that had been filled the first time? They all needed it. The 3,000 got filled one day. Today they're all getting filled. Now there's more of them. And they're filled and they speak with boldness. What's the result of the Holy Spirit being poured out on someone? They speak with boldness. Notice it didn't say they acted with boldness. Did it? They spoke with boldness. In chapter 9 we're told Paul, after being saved, had the Spirit, he was baptized with the Spirit, and he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Boldly. In chapter 13 it says, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and began to speak. Well, what prompted them to wax bold? Yeah. The Spirit. In verse 19 it says, Paul went into Ephesus and spake boldly for three years. You know what Paul faced at Ephesus? He said he was in the mouth of the lion there, wasn't he? And he spoke boldly. You know, there's a perfect picture of a man going into absolute opposition, turmoil, hatred, and yet speaking boldly, didn't he? One more time. What about Martin Luther walking right into the diocese of whatever mm -hmm. he and spoke right there, didn't he? If y'all never done that, there's some good documentaries. Watch them. Watch how they did him. Man, they got him there and they set him up. They had the whole thing set up against him. They had the questions lined up, a bunch of these Roman legalists and lawyers. They had the whole deck stacked against that man. And you know what that man did? He said, pulled out his sword and said, the just shall live by faith. And they said, yeah, but. And he said, but the Word of God says. And they said, well, we've got 12 yet. You tell him it. The Word of God says. The Word of God says. 
He did it boldly. He didn't do it arrogantly. He did it boldly. Okay? And uh, one more it says in Acts 6.19 and the passage that we're going through right now, it says in Paul's uh, about telling us how we're going to uh, need to stand in the strength of God. The last thing Paul says after the armor of God, look at verse 19, Acts 6.19. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me. He's asking them to pray for him. That utterance may be given unto me. Then what did Paul know? He knew he needed the scriptures to be given to him. Hadn't we all known something what it is to be speaking with somebody and have the verses just come, just flow to you, the ones that's needed? Any, if you've ever spoken to anyone and they've ever been saved or edified, it sure wasn't us that did it, was it? Mm -hmm. There's no 19. Ephesians 6.19. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah, I'm sorry. He, but haven't we all... Yes. Have you all have the verses come to you? Yeah. yeah, they do, don't they? So Paul's praying that utterance may be given unto me. Now watch what he's wanting them to pray for. That he gets utterance and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Why is he praying that he would make it open his mouth boldly? So people would listen. But he's been doing it for years. He should have said, I thank God that he opened my mouth and made me bold back there that day. He didn't say that, did he? See, that boldness, that grace, God don't give us a lifetime supply. He's like us, he can turn away. Yeah, that's right. He needs, he needs what He needs for that day. He needs His manna, His daily supply that day, don't you? Yes. Folks, we need what we need for the next conversation from God. When you get to the next one, you need the power and the Spirit from God for that conversation. You need everything you're going to do. I don't care if it's just getting up and going to work. Lord, let me go to work today and let me let my light shine. Let me realize I'm a Christian whether I'm speaking or not. I need the power of God to keep my eyes off the things of this world. Folks, this world, we're like little kids. Hey, Sienna, why'd you want those shoes? What's the heels do? Make you go hard. No, well, they do that. <laughs> There's a good example. We won't be lifted up, don't we? But then heels have something in them. What do they have in them? Look at them. You was telling me about them. Glitter. They sparkle. You know the old saying, all that glitters is not gold? <laughs> Everything we don't have when we look at the world looks like gold, doesn't it? You get it, and you can't figure out how to keep it from becoming cankered and rusty, can you? We've got to turn. So we're going to pick this up again some more, but these are the ways that you and I quench the Spirit. Okay? All right. Well, thank you all very much.